Welcome. Thank you for coming. So I'll be introducing the speaker. Um, and Matthew Hinter is an aquatic ecologist who is currently a postdoctoral associate at Florida International University. He completed his PhD at the University of Mississippi and has worked in freshwater systems across the United States. His research has covered such topics as habitat selection, amphibian development, and predator-prey dynamics. Currently, he works on long-term dynamics of animal populations in the Florida Everglades, while also working to document the distribution and diversity of aquatic insects in North America. So welcome to Matt. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is sort of a uh, mishmash of different things I've been doing here, why I'm here, uh, current work I have ongoing in the airplanes, and sort of what got me into working with insects uh, and some of the past work I've done. So if it doesn't all make sense to go together, you know, that's sort of why I <laughs> try to put it together. So first of all, you know, why am I here? You know, I work for a year, I work at Florida International University, uh, but I live in North Carolina. Um, so, the main point of what I'm doing here is just doing a survey of all the preserves on. So, the orders of uh, Victoria, so the true bugs, and polyopter beetles that are aquatic or um, That's the main goal of all the work I'm doing here, but everything I'm finding is becoming a part of these additional projects that I'm working on. Um, so, as John mentioned in my intro, um, you know, documenting the ranges and the, and the habitats that a lot of these different species are found in. There's, as I'll show you, there's a huge diversity of these insects in freshwater systems, and for most of them, very little is known about any sort of habitat associations. People just describe them, and you know, end up with a genus with 100 different species in it, and they just occur across North America, and you know, we don't know much about them. Um, and, I, and I guess I should also, you know, the ranges, you know, northern North America has been fairly well studied. There's always, always more to find, more unique species to, to encounter in different places than what we expect them. Um, in Florida, when I actually work, physically work there, I, on, our, on our small campus alone, I found four species of heteropter that I've never known from the U.S. before. Um, when I worked in Mississippi as a grad student, I found 35 species of one beetle family alone that weren't known from the state. So there's always, you know, a lot more to be you know in terms of where what species you find there. Um, and so also some of those species I'm collecting here are going to be incorporated into the morphological assessments of these taxa. So some, you know, there's there's people have said for a long time that so, you know maybe these two different species are actually the same one, but no one actually bothers to you know, see if any morphology is different uh, or anything else in terms of what characterizes these species other than just people talking a bit. Um, and so the last part of this is I'm collecting specimens of heteropera for phylogenetic studies I've been working with. Um, other groups of researchers are actually doing all the processing of these samples um, from South America and Europe and Asia. Uh, so no one is really collecting aquatic heteropera for these, these studies in North America right now, and so I'm kind of hoping to fill that gap in. And so you know, by coming here and getting these, you know, more and more discussions and be able to fill in more of the, the, the text for this continent. And so just to give you an idea of sort of the sort of diversity we're working with, uh, these are just from studies I've done. Um, when I was a grad student in Mississippi, I found 132 beetle species, a lot of beetle species in a 300 acre field station. Um, and I didn't study the Metro as well, but there are 42 species. The Everglades is incredibly species poor. It's a very nutrient poor system. Lots of fish everywhere, and we actually have very low beetle diversity compared to a lot of areas, and low nectar diversity. Um, but don't let this nectar diversity fool you, because one of the like the ten most common species in the whole Everglades is actually a nectar species. Um, and then here at the preserve, so this is just from my sampling I did for two weeks in June, and I haven't actually identified large groups of highly diverse genera, but there's at least 94 aquatic beetle species here in 41 members. And so, uh, just to give you an idea of freshwater systems and, and this diversity. So, 
They only got kind of 10 of a percent of Earth's surface, uh, yet they have 9.5% of the known, known species. Um, this is incredible 40% of fish species and 30%, 33% of vertebrates. Um, but, as I mentioned, I'm studying insects, and the most diverse order of organisms are the beetles with over 400,000 described species. That's including the terrestrial ones, of course. Uh, and beetles are originated in terrestrial habitats, uh, and only 3% of them are actually aquatic, which is still over 13,000 globally described. Um, and this makes them the second most uh, diverse order of animals in freshwater, other than flies. And so, yeah, this is just, you know, this gives you an overview. This is from um, a paper by Schwartz 2018. Um, huge range of beetle species across all these different families. We don't have all of these uh, here or in North America. Uh, some of those common ones are like the tissues, the gyranids. Um, we have, you know, notaries and hypothesis and hydrophilids, uh, and, uh, and, and some of these others. But, you know, there's a huge amount of diversity in, in terms of their abundance and how many species you find in each family. Um, and I'll sort of run through the diversity that we found here that we have here at this so far. Um, and I had mentioned, um, this is trying to give you an work and idea of their origination of aquatic beetles. So I mentioned that beetles originated in terrestrial habitats, um, but the aquatic lifestyles of beetles have originated at least 16 different times um, uh, in many different orders, going back hundreds of millions of years, and in many of these orders, like hydrophilids, there's instances where the aquatic beetles then move back to terrestrial habitats. We have terrestrial, you know, subfamilies in these, and then there's also instances in the subfamilies where they move back to aquatic habitats. So, it's beetles are all over the place in terms of where you're, you're finding uh, aquatic aquatic families and, and species, which is in huge contrast to the mimicry, which I'll get to in a little bit here. And so, I'm just going to run you through all the individual families just to give you an idea of this diversity. I'm not going to say a whole lot about this. Uh, the hydrophids, um, only a single species I found here so far. There could be several others. Most of these are about three millimeters long. Um, there are short crawling water beetles that are mostly herbivorous. Um, Beetleforids, uh, there's only a single genus in the whole family, but I haven't identified any of these yet because there's at least like 50 different species in North America, and I just haven't had time to. Go through all these details. So just one, 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 one genus with you know very similar looking things. Notarians, these are burrowing water beetles. There's only a single species uh, in in this region in North and Northeast. Um, so adults, adults and larvae uh, burrow uh, in the mud. So you often find them in lots of fish. Uh, Spinidae, these are often called the water pennies because these are the larvae and they. Pennies, the adults are semi aquatic, you'll find them um, along, along the water. So that's another thing. Like, if you, there are a lot of these different ones, these different pennies, you'll find that larvae are aquatic, adults are you know, sometimes terrestrial or semi aquatic. Um, in many cases, both the larvae and adults are aquatic. And there's some cases where you know, larvae are semi aquatic, and adults are terrestrial. I don't, um, I'm not. I think there's one family that we have here that where the larvae are semi, sort of like semi aquatic and also fully aquatic. Um, but it's not, not that common to have terrestrial larvae and aquatic plants. So um, these are tiny street beetles. Um, only three species so far, uh, which is not that surprising. The, the diversity of insects that you find in the streams is typically much lower than the lines. Um, this one's about three millimeters, all three millimeters long. Um, there should be more species here, but we just haven't found them yet. Um, because of how fast the water runs through? Or? No, be, because of fish, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, and just not, there's not a lot of diversity in streams. It's just, I mean, if you look around the streams, there's you know, just rocks and ripples. And if you have this pond, there's so much more diversity of different habitats that beetles can live in the lake and escape creation from fish. Um, Skeertids. These are commonly called marsh beetles because the adults you'll find on vegetation in marshes. Marshes, their adults are basically completely terrestrial, although you find them like on vegetation here, as I mentioned. Uh, the larvae are completely aquatic. Pretty high diversity. Um, this genus is a complete disaster, and I'm not going to bother trying to identify them. Uh, it's not something I want to sort out. <laughs> 
Uh, but there's a lot of diversity uh, among the other species and other, other genera. It, it's not a disaster from my view. It's it's taxonomy's <laughs> fault. Uh, I tried. It. I haven't found any of these, but these are the smallest ones. This one here, uh, this length is probably about 1.2 millimeters. Um, it's wide, wide. They're hard to find, <laughs> especially when you're sorting through all the other rocks that you might pull out when you're looking for them in pods. Um, but there should be a bunch of species in this general region. Generates. These are the working beetles that you'll see swimming around the water surface, both on streams and ponds. Um, there's a lot of species here, I haven't gotten around to identifying them. The uh, genetics are much larger, uh, which are these ones that took me about 70 or long. Um, Elephids, these are herbivorous as adults and larvae. Um, there's only two genera in this entire region, pretty high diversity, there could be even more species. These, if you ever find them, they're basically like little rocks. I mean, they're Basically, leaves production, like <laughs> anything that needs some help, they can swallow them whole, and they might even survive the need that some studies have shown with other other beetles. <laughs> now, getting into the more diversity of these, so hydrophilids, these are water, often called water scavenger beetles. The adults will are often herbivorous, or they'll um, feed on detritus and other debris in the streams. With the larvae, almost, almost always predaceous, and a bunch of different genera, lots of different species. I only single out this species here because this one was um, accidentally discovered near Toronto a few years ago. Uh, it is native to the area from France to Japan, and I found them in basically all the different habitats here. So, the previously un undocumented species um, occurring. occurring. This first record for New York and the US, I guess. And then the Lutisids are the most diverse family. Uh, a bunch of, the, I don't even think they included all the groups on here, I haven't identified yet. But um, they, these things will range in size from about a millimeter, uh, for the different faculty, up to over 35 millimeters in size. This is for, for the Lutisids. Um, uh, this species here is a new record from New York. The closest other records are, I think they're in the back somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I actually went. Uh, I was at the Cornell Insect Collection today, looking for you know missing insects like this that we just haven't even published or anything and haven't found any. So uh, they really are the first records, uh, even if no one's found them before. And so those are the, that's just an overview of all the beetles we have. And now I'm going to show you the diversity of Heteroptera. And in contrast to the beetles. These occur, the aquatic and semi aquatic heteroptera can occur in three nice and size groups, three different different orders. Uh, the leptopodomorpha are a single family in North America, but four families in the about 350 species. These are called shore bugs. Uh, this species are on the shore, uh, on ponds, on lakes, beaches, basically anywhere on salt flats. Uh, the nepomorpha, these are all, all as larvae, they are fully. Aquatic, and most families are fully aquatic as adults as well. Um, 22 new species of fully aquatic families. And the Jared Morpha, these are semi aquatic as adults, although the eggs are fully aquatic and the moons are also semi aquatic. Um, 2,000 species of And I'll just run through all of these shortly, but there's a lot less diversity of them than the beetles. Um, so, Bellus gamadids, uh, only two species here, only probably only will find those, those two. This is, you know, Phosphorus americanus, it's called. It's called, they're called, called toe biters just to get people to think they get bitten by them or pinched by them. Um, these are one of the largest aquatic insects in the world. They reach about seven centimeters in length. They all branch out? No. Um, so if you grab, uh, so beetles are all hard when you know, when, when they cut up, when you feel them. And uh, these are more soft, uh, although depending on their, how, how old they are as adults, they feel like um, Brexids, this is the most diverse family of aquatic heteroptera. There should be a bunch more species than this, but this, these are really annoying to identify. These basically only have to have adult males for most of them. Uh, all of the females are basically indistinguishable um, from different species. Like, I can tell that the females are Pomerexa, but I can't assume it's the two families, or the two species we have here. 
And same thing goes for a lot of other accidents. Uh, the Jarrah's, these are you know, called water spreaders. Aquarius Hermitus is basically the most common species you'll see on streams in most of North America. Um, Jarrah's and the forests are common on, on ponds and other palm habitats, including some common sections of streams. I, I don't know if I mentioned but like all, all of these are kind of are pernicious and adults regardless of their size. Uh, and you see rates, most of these are about two millimeters or less in size. Um, they're found around lots of utility of vegetation. Um, could be a few more species than these three. Uh, well, hydrometrids, these are called water measurers. There's only a single species in this region. This is one of the ones that people think is not actually a valid species. It's just a symptom of Hydrometra australis, uh, which is found the south. And they're called water measures, I think, because they're uh, they walk along the water surface and they're always about uh, a centimeter in length. So you can basically water you measure the water. Uh, these are the Laidae, um, only a single species I found here. Two other very uncommon species might occur here, but they are very, very rare and difficult to find. Um, now, corns, these are called creeping water bugs. These are, you know, quite venomous if one bites you. A lot of these are, but, you know, some, depending on the size of them, you know, and their propensity for biting these. If you grab them, they will bite. This is the only species in, in the Northeast. Uh, Name of the day, a uh, single species I found. There could be maybe two others. Um, there's two others found in North America, but I don't know if they're coming around here. But, um, they're called water scorpions, not because these ones look like scorpions, but because the family that they were described of in the living Europe uh, looked more like scorpions. And then the nodonectids, these are back swimmers because you will find them swimming upside down um, in the water. Uh, I've only found three species in these genes, so there should be a number of genes here that type of species as well. These are also very venomous, and if you grab them, they'll bite you. No, they won't hurt you. It'll, it'll hurt, it'll fizz in there, but it won't do anything to you. It'll just be like a lost skin or something like that. And then our parents, <laughs> our parents, uh, just a single species I found. These are these are aquaticas, news, but they are full of, or they're semi aquaticas adults. And it's you know, the smallest species, these are about a millimeter and a half long. These are kidney back swimmers, which are also swimming upside down. Um, Solid Bay, as I mentioned, is a short line that's found along the long, on terrestrial areas near water, sometimes along the water itself. So, um, there should be more species of this family here. A lot of the heteroptera I hadn't found as many as with beetles uh, because they're not as diverse, but also because um, they're kind of more common later in the summer, which is why I'm coming back. And lastly, I believe, the Belay Bay, these are Riffle bugs, pygmy water squirt, or pygmy water spiders, depending on what type of terminology you prefer. Only a single rate of really species in the region, and uh, at least three species here, maybe a couple of others, if I can find them. And so, I guess, you know, that was just a quick, sort of quick overview of just the species we have. But what has gotten me into studying these is the question that I started. You know, asking, and it's one of the most common questions, of course, in ecology is what generates the abundance and distribution of species. And in, in aquatic systems and freshwater systems in particular, the, the main point of this is, you know, is, is summed up by Wellborn here is that nearly every class of free living freshwater animals sort among habitats according to their permanence or in relation to the predators whose own permanent, whose own distributions are related to permanence. And so to illustrate this, we can take you know, just two different ponds, one temporary on the left, one on the right, and you know, say you know, when the temporary one has water, at least, what sorts of animals we find in those ponds? And in temporary ponds, you find lots of insects and amphibians and, and other sorts of all, all sorts of other things that are often very you know, things susceptible to invasion by the animals you often find in permanent ponds, which are fish and lots of fish. Often find. And you also could find some insects, like I mentioned, brighter beak beetles uh, swimming on the water surface, they actually excrete. These nasty compounds that fish hate, um, and then the tears which will bury the substrate and fish. Normally, don't get in there, but I'll show you an exception to that uh, later in the talk. And so, what I've been studying, you know, the effects of these predators that generate this 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 sort of these patterns that we observe can, you know, be broadly clumped into two groups. You know, first are consumption effects, which are exactly what it sounds like 
you know, you have a big predator like a fish, and it, you think it just basically goes around eating everything, and so when it does that, you don't have the species there. But what a lot of my work, uh, first as a grad student, has focused on uh, was non consumptive effects. And these are, you know, South Carolina group has changed to diet, morphology, physiology, and behavior. And I mostly focused on a uh, form of behavior which we term the demographic habitat selection, where the decisions of these animals on where they go directly affect the population sizes and find the different habitats. And so, in the case of a beetle, so this is an aquatic beetle, uh, and for all these, all these aquatic beetles, I, don't, I didn't mention this, but they they live in the water, it's larvae, they move onto the land and pupate, and once they pupate and emerge as adults, they have to be able then fly and find another aquatic habitat to live in. And so when you present a beetle like this with two different choices, a pond with a fish and a pond without fish, you would expect it to go to the pond without fish. And so you know, you start seeing that well, we have more beetles in this habitat than the fish, it starts breeding in there, and it just seems to be the cycle. And so a lot of my previous work was done using experimental music housing, such as these large cattle tanks. I don't know if you've walked around the Lincoln Pond, but I have two small wading pools. I did a lot of studies with that. Mm -hmm. And so those wading pools are sort of just a method of capturing beetles that really don't like fish, uh, and I may not have found otherwise just how to try and collect them. And so with these experiments, we, we looked at uh, the responses of different, many different these colonizing insects to many different characters, but I'll just show this example of you know using four different fish species. So we place these fish uh, basically underneath these screens uh, on these on these mesocosms, and so the fish are never never able to even prey on these insects, and we see what sorts of populations colonize or the abundances of these different species that colonize them. And when we do this, uh, this is just the total abundance of insects. So. This is a control here on the left without any insect or without any fish in it. You can see a much higher level of colonization than either of these three species in terms of total abundance and the total species richness uh, in these habitats. This species uh, here is a is is the only one that we've been able to find out of like 50 species we've tested uh, that is, is unique. And I'm not going to go into here, but if you want to know, you can ask me later. Uh, but as you see, you know, you can see how just the presence of fish. Uh, Starts changing the populations in these habitats before they're ever able to be consumed. Excuse me? Yeah. Can you run through it one more time? There's your traps, and you put the fish in the trap, in the water, yeah. and then a screen across the top. Yeah, so. And the, then how, how do the beetles get in there or not get in there? So, yeah, these are. So, as I mentioned, the beetles, they, they're living, they're typically found in. When they emerge uh, as adults from patient sites and freshwater habitats, they fly across the landscape looking for somewhere to go. And so these are naturally dispersing populations of beetles, um, and they'll go and colonize, which everyone's at least feels like colonizing. We go and take them all out of there and, and identify them. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you see, yeah, okay, yeah, the, uh, you know, reduced colonization with single fish species present, and uh, yeah, this is just annoying story. I don't know if you need to go through this, but this is uh, just looking at combining different species. And so, you know, if you look at these three individual ones, three species individually, uh, this one, it, it, you know, in this case, there's not a reduction in the number of insects that are colonizing this with the species, but there are with these ones. Um, and then you combine multiple species, so two of the species. Or these two species, these two species, and all three, uh, all generate lower colonization rates. And in some cases, we get we get patterns observed by combining species that you would not even predict based off of individual responses. And so, just to sort of try to you know integrate the, these non-consumptive effects, the, the consumptive effects, and and the traits of these beetles, what I did. With this study, is I looked at all of these different beetle species and looked at the predation rates uh, of this. Uh, this is not a fish; this is a bacterium. But they will prey on each of these beetles, and when it preys on them, it'll, it'll attack the beetle right here between the thorax and the abdomen, um, to basically resolve what this is observed to be decapitation of these beetles. Um, and so, when we do that, you know, we look at the decapitation rate. So, some of these species, these two on the left here. <laughs> 
uh, have over 95% mortality in the presence of, of, of this insect, but some of these have basically 0%. So you're seeing a huge variation in, in their susceptibility to predation by this insect. Um, and so when I, when I observed this, we wanted to know, you know, first, well, I mean, I guess first is easy. What, what, gen, why, what makes these beetles susceptible in our traits that, you know, are, are leading to this pattern that we observe? And then also, are they are these species that are highly susceptible actually avoiding this insect uh, at the colonization stage? And when we do this, um, so this is only six of those species because when you're doing these experiments, you can only get, use what you actually get. Um, um, so six of these species, so you know, Trubus turns loud around, this species has no difference in what is oh that's the mushroom <laughs> 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 this species, you know, it's basically no mortality in, in the presence of this insect. It's not avoiding it in the colonization stage, so you know, it's not being harmed, but you know, it doesn't matter if you actually avoid it. Um, this species, you're seeing actually a reduction in the colonization rate when, when, the, when, the, when this insect is present in those pools, um, but it's also not susceptible. You know, you might think this is a waste of effort, but if you consider the offspring, so the larvae are often much more susceptible to predation than, than the adults because they don't have these hard nexus things like the beetles. Uh, two species with more intermediate rates of, of predation, and in both of these cases, there's slight reductions in their colonization rates. Um, so they're somewhat affected by the predator, and there's also avoiding at some predator rates. Um, this species is basically unaffected by the predator, but it's mysteriously colonizing these pools at higher rates with the predator. And you know, it took us a while to figure out why this could be. We're not totally certain, but we just bring that out there, which we'll get to in a second. And then lastly, this species also colonizing these pools at higher rates, but in, in, in contrast to this one, it is basically being decimated by the predator. Um, so this makes complete, you know, basically no sense. It's, it's colonizing, you know, habitats with this predator at higher rates, and it's basically all mining. Um, it, it, it's almost like a natural ecological trap where you, you thought that maybe this predator is attracting them, um, but you don't think it's actually, you know, officially evolved to be that way. But um, we did find these two compounds are for semi chemicals, so information carrying chemicals that are produced by both of these insects uh, as pheromones, so they're used to, by these insects to attract mates, um, but they're also produced by the predator of, of, of these insects. Um, for some unknown reason, we don't know why, uh, but our, our idea is that you know these compounds are being produced by the predator. These two insects think that they're you know there's not specific say that the mates and they're being attracted to pools, and in this case, they're all bad. And so uh, the last part, which I mentioned of this of this work, is just looking at different traits. So I looked at the size of these, just two different measures of these. So the size, and, you know, the size of Incorporated length in both of these beetles. Um, uh, swimming, so I recorded them all with the video and analyzed the swimming speed and their maximum acceleration. So if you're, you know, they can swim fast, you can uh, get away from this predator. And then the last word, hardness and structural property. So I used, I wanted to do hardness, but the people with all the fancy equipment and engineering departments didn't want to do it. Um, so I was only really able to use. Uh, assess the amount of force, which uh, they used to mimic the, 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 the effect that these predators are having. So I use this force gauge uh, to basically press this device into here uh, and try and document the amount of force that you need to actually separate the, these two body parts, like the when it's running on. And so don't worry about all these individual graphs. So these are all those five traits. You see a huge amount of variation in each of them across all these different species. But when we combine them all um, into a principal components analysis, if you don't know what this is, it's just sort of taking all those five different variables and see how they lay out in different states and looking at what traits contribute to different axes here. And so when we look at the, the blue area is the ones that are basically not affected by predation. And so in this case, this species uh, you know, has, has a very high force, in some, in some cases like eight moons of force, which is a, Crazy amount to actually be much of an insect. Um, we're seeing that it's experiencing basically no predation. And, and the larger ones, this is the largest species, so we see the length and width coming out this way. And then the faster two species, which are these ones, we see 
Uh, actually, this one's kind of catchy to know, but you're, you're seeing, you know, the mall segregate based off these different traits, and then the highly vulnerable species are all slower, smaller, or basically the very weak bodies. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and so that's an abrupt transition. <laughs> so uh, I basically attached my calculated, the uh, initial version of my calculated I'm giving uh, in a week or two weeks or whatever it is in Montreal at the Electrical Society of America conference on my current work in the Everglades. And so, as, as many of you might know, uh, you know, Florida and especially South Florida is really a hot spot for uh, non native species in North America. Uh, just put some numbers behind that. There's over 200 species of plants, 180 species of fish, dozens of reptiles, birds, insects, and you can go on basically across every different you know, type of organism you'll find non native species in Florida. Um, but if you bring up this topic to anyone, you're probably going to think about cyclones. Um, they are the sensationalistic story, uh, which stems from. I don't actually remember what I put out there. So. <laughs> So the, this, the, the effects of pythons stem from a 2012 study that uh, associated the increase in the number of pythons that they were removing from the Everglades with a concurrent decline in the sightings of mammals along roadways. Um, you're just looking at mammals along roads and seeing, you know, you know what's the difference between the 90s and 2000s, basically. And they, for a lot of you know, smaller mammals, especially they're over 90% decline in their abundance. But the Everglades is a large wetland system that doesn't never really have many mammals in it. Uh, they're not very common. Most, you know, in some of the terrestrial areas, which are very limited, you will find mammals, but you're not going to see many out in these spatially expansive marshes that cover most of the region. And you know, that's not to detract from the effects that these pythons are having. They, you know, in terrestrial areas, they are reducing lots of these mammal populations, but. They get a huge amount of attention just because people are, quite frankly, scared by their snakes and you know large ones that people find you know training alligators and dogs and other things like that. But in the Everglades, um, you know, it's a it's a large wetland and you find tons and tons of fish. And non-native fish, uh, these are just a list of the non-native fishes, large, large non-native fishes that have established themselves in the Everglades since uh, the 1950s, but there were none known in the region. And so we just see this progression of species over the decades uh, of all these different species uh, arriving in the region. All the red ones are cichlids, um, uh, originating from either Africa or Central America or South America. So a lot of different cichlids. Um, but uh, this all culminates in 1997. It was made in swamp eel, and we also get peat populace later. They're very different. Um, neither of these are actually true eels. Um, uh, for many decades, the mine cichlids were the most common non-native fish you would find just about anywhere in, in South Florida. Uh, that is practically changing now as we're going to look at the effects of these hidden swamp eels. And so, I should say, like there, you know, there's been some studies uh, over over the past maybe 20 years looking at trying to look at the effects of various non-native species in every place, and most of them have found very little to no effect. They see, you know, slight declines in populations. You know, in, in, in like creeks and canals, these deep areas that are refuges when you find huge numbers of these in, in, in the dry season. Um, but there's not a whole lot of convincing, uh, you know, evidence showing any effects on these non-native species, which could be due to the fact that the Everglades typically dries down when it does wet and dry seasons. You know, in, in the dry season, not enough fish can survive in the marsh because it's dry, fish with water. Uh, and then about every once every 10 years, uh, typically on average, historically at least, there would be a whole period that would um, wreck a lot of these populations of non native species that originate from the tropics because they can't survive cold temperatures. And then also, all of these cichlids, as I highlighted, uh, studies have shown that they are very functionally similar to some tropics like sunfish and bats, uh, which are native and very common in the region. So, they might just be, you know, added to that same, from the same level of fish pressure that we already have in these species. And so, swamp eels uh, have been introduced at least four times in the United States. Uh, three times in Florida, two times in Miami Dade County alone, um, one time in Atlanta, and all three of those, or all four of those populations are still doing well to this day. Although, one in Atlanta is basically restricted to the single river. There has been observed sightings in various cities of, of these branches across across the continent, from Toronto to Houston. Um, 
but none of those populations are known very well established. And so these the swampules, um, they possess two traits, or a set of traits rather, that are basically the combination make them unlike any sort of other fish in these ways. So they're hematocytes, they're hematocytes, uh, they all start up as females, and as, as they grow largely, they all become males. Um, they're somewhat salt tolerant, which in large wetland like Everglades uh, moves them to swim along the, the coastal areas with some you know, level of salinity. Uh, they're all often good air breathers, so you'll see them coming to the surface in the air. And then, most notably, and most important here, uh, they burrow into the substrates to survive their own. So, they're able to burrow in these substrates during the dry season in the Everglades and spend their entire time there while it hurts. All the other fishes, non native and native alike, have to go to canals or alligator ponds or some deeper habitats for the winter. So, when they burrow, do they have to come up to breathe? No. They, they, I don't know all the physiology that they don't know. They don't need to. They, there's, yeah. Um, and pe people also think they're capable of making other land movements, so people often see them on the roads. Although, evidence for this is kind of limited. Sometimes people think they, they, you know, they, they find them on the roads, but they've been damaged, so like maybe a bird dropped in there or something. Um, but this seems to be more common than I can see uh, on the other things. And so, in 2009, Schaff and Adele did this study based off of very little, <laughs> very little data and observation. And they, they, they stated that there are no deleterious ecological effects associated with swamp beetle. Um, and that due to <laughs> they get this, their relatively small mouths, weak swimming attributes, poor vision, slow growth, and other characteristics that seems unlikely to cause major ecological or economic disturbances in Florida. And at the time they wrote the swamp beetles were only known from canals. They have not left many of the vast canal systems of Florida. And so our lab at FIU has been doing long-term monitoring of the marshes uh, at 20 sites across the Everglades um, for the past since 1996. So we have long-term data on all the large and small fish and amphibians and, and uh, invertebrates in the system. And so we've been able to track the spread of these swamp eels. Um, so the, I mentioned there were two populations uh, introduced in Miami. One, the first record was here in the north and one here in the south in the homestead. These are all the various various canals. So when that study was published, they were only known from these canals in this region. And this all started in 2009, same year that study was published when they were recorded here at Laurel Palm, which is the most popular part of the park. Um, there's, it's an artificially deep area that was part of the state park for people to go see alligators before the National Park was created. Um, they were found there being eaten by a bird in 2009. And then you see at our long-term monitoring sites in Taylor Slough, uh, over the next few years, they start popping up. Um, this region, the Panhandle, we didn't start actually sampling them until they were present, which is why they're black. Um, but the, the two major watersheds in the Everglades, the Stripe River Slough and Taylor Slough, we have data going back to at least 1996. And so we see them appear in Shark River Slough here in 2019 and spread throughout the region within you know, the next year. This site is a little lag because of our data sampling. But uh, we saw see them go into the, this vast uh, marsh area at the north of the Everglades, the water conservation area 38, starting uh, last year. And so at the same time, we're seeing all of these swamp eels spread uh, north and west throughout the Everglades. We have also seen there's a Tampa population up there um, and spreading down <laughs> to, the, to the south. Um, but no one's actually monitoring them and with any sort of data like we are completing. And so with these data, and this long history of invasion in Taylor Slough, um, we just you know thought to look at and see what the trends are in the population if there's anything associated with their presence. And so, oh, this is just showing the density actually, actually as well. So this is Taylor Slough. This is that area with a long history. We have uh, this great period, this is quite great period, which we're calling the, the invasion period um, when, from when they were first detected at World Home until they were established at all of our sites, and then the, this later period. Um, when they uh, were have been established during the entire time, and this is the period we're focusing our analyses on. And so, here in Taylor Slough, um, swamp eels are now more common than every other large fish species combined. Uh, in the Panhandle, this is a kind of unique period because it's very dry. They are basically the only uh, uh, large fish species we find in that region. Um, these are the actual uh, these are juvenile catches from our pro trapping efforts. And the green or the blue, blue spots are, are 
uh, electro fishing uh, based off air dome, airboat electro fishing data. And we see, you know, recent invasion of the Trek so, so not much to go off of there. But with these data, we can take, we took our three most common uh, invertebrate species and our six most common small fish species. Um, so this is the Everglades crayfish. Uh, during this first initial period, we had over 8,000 individuals we caught. Um, there's a huge amount of variation between years and within years. Uh, this is due to this huge amount of uh, hydrologic variation in the Everglades. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these species are can fall into two categories: ones that are drought adapted or drought resistant. And in terms of the Everglades crayfish, this is a, a drought adapted species. So, in terms when we find dry years, we have to find abundances. And so, we took this initial period. We used all of our our hydrologic data and. And model with the expected relationship of based on hydrology we find in the subsequent years once the swamp hill shows up. And then we you know, compare our observations to what was actually observed, and once the swamp hill is being established, we see that the spray fish is basically eliminated from the entire region. Um, this red line is the mean of the predicted value, it's in water, so we expected fewer of them, um, but we didn't expect a really 100% decline in the population. And there's a second crayfish species as well, um, the slew crayfish, and we see basically the exact same thing with the species. And these two, the, the crayfish, are arguably some of the most important, the, the most important species in the Everglades because they are uh, the most important prey for many wading birds, uh, which the Everglades was in large part established to protect their breeding grounds. But you know. It's just two crayfish species, right? Uh, two of our small fish species, flagfish, marsh fish, our populations have also collapsed. Um, I'll get to why in a second, but these are both drought adapted drought, drought species. Um, we have two other fish, eastern mosquito fish and golden potnos, that since it, since invasion uh, we've seen in the declines as much as 60% in the station and almost 50% here, depending on which prediction. Predictive, uh, predictive value we use uh, the initial period. We, I, I guess I didn't really explain why we use this. Uh, these first six years were the most hydrologic is similar to these last six years of the study. Uh, so which is why we're comparing this and this and first and this, which was a very dry period compared to the more recent. And then these two species, Doing quite well. No difference in population from observed or predicted values. Um, these are both extremely small fish. They don't really get over two centimeters in length. So if you think you're going to replace a pretty fish, you're going to be that thing with one of these. And then lastly, our fracturing these, you know, not really a good word for you either. Um, new populations. <laughs> Are going up with the hydrology, um, but no difference first of what we predict based off of the conditions. And so we can group all of these nine species into two main categories drought and powder and drought adapted. And the drought and powder ones we classify as slow recolonizers and rapid recolonizers, which I'll explain here. So the ones that are slow recolonizers, so after the March floods, at the start of the wet season in June, we see that these ones are very slow to come back from. Um, in the deeper areas where there's refuges uh, and recolonize the or previously dry marshes. In all three of these species, we observe no change in the populations. The ones that are rapid recolonized, so they, they're very fast to swim back uh, from, from refuges at the start of the dry season. For golden cotton and some mosquito fish, these are the ones we saw in the immediate declines in their populations. So, um, and then lastly, the drought adapted species. Are the, one, are the four species we observed population collapses in. And so the reasoning behind this all goes back to the fact that I mentioned that swamp eels survive all year in, in, these, in the marshes by burning into the sediment. So as soon as they reflood, swamp eels are there preying on all of these fish. So these two uh, have this case resistant eggs that they lay and hatch immediately upon flooding. Uh, these two burrow uh, and will come out and breed immediately at the start of the season. And so all four of these are being heavily affected by the swamp hill's presence. While these ones swim back quickly uh, and are affected, uh, you know, the inter intermediate amount, but uh, they're really continually buffered by the top fish and everything else. Are those 
numbers in relation to the predicted or just total? That's just the, that's that's the uh, that's the comparison from the first six years. Yeah, I mean, I did the film that I showed for some <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, with this rapid spread, we're starting to see here in the Everglades. Um, Taylor Slough was never, it's the most nutrient poor part of the Everglades. It was never really a big area for um, birds to breed. Um, but Shark River Slough is much more of one, and this area of the Everglades is one of the, it's one of the most remote areas of the park, and also where most of the wading birds breed. So, once we see these small fields heading over here, we might see start to see changes in some of these waiting bird populations, which their success has been, in, in certain ones like the bright ibis, has been tightly tied to the months of the great fish during the dry season. And so, if you just think this is under the tip so here, we can, you know, just, I can just show you our data for one species from Trek River Slough and Panhandle, and then see it for day. So, as I mentioned, the Panhandle has also a long history of invasion that starts with our data. Um, so Taylor Stewart showed you the seeded collapse in the population of Panhandle. Um, swamp eels had already started colonizing here, so we don't know what the swamp eel densities were, but since then we see all the super elimination of, of prey fish in this region. WCA38, uh, as I mentioned, this is a drought adapted species. Most of the years this this area is basically flooded all the time, so there's not it's not a great habitat for a drought adapted prey fish. Um, but Shark River Slough, uh, there's a lot of variation here, but since the swamp hills arrived, we have seen populations basically go to zero. Um, this is only data through last summer. I've, I've looked at the data through this April, but it's currently it's basically zero at all of our sites. Um, so it's not looking good for shark um, but we'll see as the years go on what happens. And the same, these same sort of consistencies are observed from all the other species across these regions. And so you know, what, what is the future of these swamp eels in the Everglades? Well, we're seeing this rapid expansion to the north and to the west. We're seeing the, the other populations spread to the south and also to the east uh, towards Orlando. Um, if they move further north, this is not good because once you get up to the port of Command Handle, if they're able to establish in those areas, there's lots of them, small, small range restricted endemic creature species in there, not just two you know, expansive species in the front and south of the Unfortunately, uh, as you may know, the Everglades is undergoing what is projected to be at least a $23 billion restoration project to restore flow uh, to Shark River Slough, which is aimed to support populations of wading birds by increasing the amount of crayfish and uh, fish for crayfish for birds, fish for alligators, feed on. Um, and this is all associated, uh, so the, this initial appearance here. Uh, started with this the canal here at C113 and C111 canals around the time where they started pumping extra water from these canals into Taylor Slough. Um, so the very restoration then, you know, is aimed to preserve these or increase the population of waiting birds and help protect the Everglades is potentially destroying it. Um, I mean, it's only it's only been ten years since it was so this. Maybe we have hope that swamp eels will collapse in their population. Um, we're not going to have swamp eel roundups like you see python roundups because you know, only precious swamp eels you go fishing basically via the electro chopper to get them. Um, so yeah, it's not looking great. And yeah, I, I'm not happy about um, So. <laughs> Uh, I just so this is all the people who helped me with my previous projects in grad student. This is all right, but I used stuff and I took lots of photos from my naturalist because I do a lot of stuff there. If you want to see all the insects that I find here, I will post them to iNaturalist. There's already a lot there. Um, and I guess I should have added all the <laughs> people from the preserve here and the funding that I received to do my work here. And so that's all. Can you please see? You said you found one beetle here that had not been found in the U.S. yet. There was, yeah. They, they had, so the the study that found in Canada had just like grabbed a bunch of random beetles from all over the place and like TV ball and them in and just threw them into a database and one came back as a species from from Europe. Um, and I mean they verified it with specimens, but yeah, and so that's the species that I found here. Is there 
concern in Canada about its impact? No, no, is it? no, no, no. The subfamily it's in, it's really weird because this is, this is one of the ones that was, the subfamily was um, the terrestrial subfamily. Uh, this one became quiet. And, uh, there's lots of other non native species in the subfamily, but not other, part, other subfamilies in this movie. Um, and they're all associated with uh, like cow. Mm -hmm. huh. And the other beetle that you said, I think, was yeah. Is that how how you how do people think they are being moved? Are they? Oh, uh, it's, it's probably just. It's, it's been here. Like this is probably like a similar to some of those ones that just happened. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the long range of the plant and the aggregates? Was that in place before the large sheds and some of those? Oh, yeah. I don't know what the idea of well, it's always been to increase the flow uh, into the southern end because it was stopped, the natural flow was stopped by building all these levees and canals. Um, and so they're engineering their way out of this to increase the flow better. Uh, rather than just, I, and, well, in some cases, they're reducing the power levels. But yeah, it goes back to then, and it's just, yeah, I, I don't know. There's, there's no stopping what they're doing at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it, this isn't very well known yet among the yeah, great community just because we're trying to get this published and it's just very slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we share it with lots of those guys. Are all of the non native fish intentional introductions? Are they? No. So the swamp eels, no one really wants them as pets or anything. They were almost certainly brought here because any time, like, they are a very common food in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, they're like important live for food and mm -hmm. just escape somehow. Mm -hmm. Lots of other things like the Oscars and cichlids are wearing the fish. Right. Yeah. How do you measure uh, the beetles' like, speed? Oh, so I, I recorded a video of them. Um, it was like basically like a camera. Just I I got a container. This is like this is the container. I put water in it to a certain depth so they couldn't like go up and down, which is really like the speed machines. Um, and just like threw the beetle in and just like recorded its swing for a while and and ran a program to just measure it frame by frame oh. and extracted its average speed over that time and an average of like the maximum acceleration. How does the beetles know that there's a fish in the pool? Uh, based, so I mean, as as very visually oriented creatures, mm -hmm. us, us, we we often don't perceive uh, the fact that most other animals have fairly very highly adapted olfactory senses. They can smell things. There's basically everything is exuding some sort of chemical all the time. And when you have these fish in the water, you're having all sorts of chemicals that volatilize off the water, and then you just detect them as they're flying. Yeah. Um, can you just kind of go over, you had a couple of like, hypotheses for why some of the beetles were at higher densities with the in the presence of the, the predator? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's it's very limited data we're going off of. We're just sort of based. I don't know what the database is called, like phenobase or something. It's a, you can look up search of certain species in these databases online, and they bring out all the published studies that document the chemicals that are known to be produced by each of these species. And so there was one chemical that we knew was produced by both those species that are colonizing the colonies at higher rates, and that predator, but none of the other species produce this chemical. And it's known to be a, a pheromone, so it, you know it tracks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you.